Okay, so we have been discussing self-adjoint operators and Hermitian operators and how uh, the boundary conditions give rise to orthogonal eigenfunctions uh, with real eigenvalues. And uh, today what we will do is, uh, is separation of variables. We'll start with a very simple example. Um, so this method works for linear homogeneous partial differential equations. Uh, that have self-adjoint operators within them and that have uh, homogeneous boundary conditions. So uh, those are all three requirements for having separation of variables work. Um, and uh, the simplest example uh, is the heat equation. That is what we will start with. Uh, this equation is certainly linear. Uh, the self-adjoint operator is the second derivative with respect to x. Uh, that's this guy. Um, and uh, we will start with the two simplest boundary conditions. These are just Dirichlet boundary conditions. Temperature at the ends of the bar uh, are clamped at zero for all time. Uh, now the initial condition, uh, you will notice, does not conform to that, to that boundary condition, and so we expect that convergence will be slow uh, at the end of this problem. So that says that the temperature uh, as a function of x, the initial time is 100x over L, uh, which is this ramped uh, kind of temperature profile at the initial time. Okay, so uh, in separation of variables, we're going to assume uh, that the full solution t of x and t can be written as a product of one function that depends only on time and another function that depends only on x. And now, writing down what the partial derivatives of, of t are, uh, we have x, uh, um, so with differentiating with respect to t, we have x times theta prime, and differentiating with respect to x twice, we have theta times x prime prime. Uh, plugging these two uh, into our differential equation, we find this x theta prime equals alpha squared theta x prime prime. Uh, it's customary to go ahead and divide through by uh, big X times, uh, times theta here. Um, that changes our uh, differential equation into this form. Now you'll notice that all of the t dependence is on the left-hand side and all of the x dependence is on the right-hand side. And the argument in all of uh, separation of variables technique is that is that if you, um, if you have separated the two variables, then the only way that you can independently vary x and t and maintain this equality is uh, if the two sides are actually both equal to the same constant. And so, so that's what we do. We introduce the separation constant, and then we have to go through and try and figure out whether that separation constant should be a negative number, zero, or a positive number. And uh, that process gives us, uh, if we're lucky, an equation that defines the eigenvalues. So, uh, so let's uh, go ahead and use our, our physical intuition. We just solved this problem the other day in the form of an ordinary differential equation. Uh, and, uh, and what we saw there was that uh, the solution which gave rise to oscillatory functions, sines and cosines in that case, uh, was the one that worked. Um, we will make the, we will assume that this one comes out the same way and just take uh, at the outset, lambda equals minus some kappa squared. Uh, so now our differential equation that involves the, the uh, self-adjoint operator, that is the second derivative operator, is the equation that we begin with. Um, we, we now have uh, the x prime prime equals minus kappa squared times x. Uh, that gives me a cosine plus b sine with arguments of kappa x. Impl imposing my boundary condition at x equals zero. Uh, that gets rid of immediately the sine term when I let x equals zero in here. Uh, but the cosine goes to one, which says that a, that what I'm left with is, is this amplitude uh, variable a. And that must be zero. So, so we have to uh, get rid of all cosine contributions to our solution. And all we're left with is the sines. Uh, we have another boundary condition at x equals l. Uh, and over there at x equals l, we have that our solution should again go to zero. So now we have uh, sine of kappa times L and uh, multiplied by an amplitude, which is completely irrelevant. Uh, but if we choose, if we choose KL uh, such that that's equal to N pi, that is to say every time we go uh, across the, uh, the period of the oscillation here, uh, we have to come back to a factor of, uh, to a multiple of pi. Uh, then we have, uh, we have for all integers, n equals 1, 2, 3, uh, we find uh, different values of this kappa uh, eigenvalue. This is, remember, this is not really the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue is minus kappa squared, uh, but it's common to refer to this as the eigenvalue. So uh, you have to bear with that. Even in the literature, people will refer to that in writing as the eigenvalue, even though it's really only uh, the negative square root of the eigenvalue. Okay, so uh, this kappa sub n is given by n pi over L, and that gives us eigenfunctions that are uh, sine of this n pi x over L. 
Okay, so now remember that this second derivative operator was self-adjoint and we started with homogeneous boundary conditions. And that means that the uh, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues are going to have all the properties of uh, that the spectral theorem tells us that they will have. Uh, in particular, they're going to be orthogonal to each other uh, when m is not equal to n. Okay, so um, so in the, you know, in general, I can write this with a Kronecker delta, uh, but I have to remember uh, to include the factor of the squared norm of eigenfunction m uh, in, that, in that definition, which is L over 2 in this case. Uh, just you know, pop that into Mathematica or draw some pictures as uh, we've discussed in the past and you'll see that that is the normalization uh, condition. Okay, so, um, so now what we have left to do is to solve the theta part of this equation. Uh, that was just a simple first order differential equation describing an exponential decay. Uh, the solution is here. And note that the eigenvalue uh, that we found, that, that uh, minus n pi over L squared, pops up right here. Um, and if you check the units on this, this is appropriately dimensionless. And uh, so everything, everything works out here. Uh, okay, so uh, the larger the eigenvalue, the faster this mode decays. And uh, so what we're really seeing here is that we have uh, a whole bunch of pairs of solutions. Theta n multiplied by xn is a solution for every n. And so any linear combination of those is also going to be a solution. We don't need explicit uh, constants in here because there's already one sitting in here as part of the theta equation. Uh, so this is the eigenfu nth eigenfunction. This is the uh, nth uh, time dependent function theta. And, uh, and now we sum all those up and we still have left uh, to identify those uh, those FOIA coefficients, the theta n sub zeros. Uh, so the way that we do that matching of the initial conditions is to take t of x in, at time zero. Uh, we know that that should be equal to 100x over L. Uh, that was our initial condition. And when we plug in t equals zero into this expression, the exponential part vanishes, goes to one, uh, and then and then we're left with the theta n zero times x n. So what this really says is that we have a FOIA series now. Uh, for this object in terms of the eigenfunctions that we had found. And in order to find the coefficients of that Fourier series, we do the same thing that we've always done, and that is to use the orthogonality property of these eigenfunctions. So if we take the dot product on the left uh, with the mth eigenfunction uh, with our initial uh, condition, that will give us, um, using this relation, uh, that will give us um, the dot product on the left uh, with the mth eigenfunction in this series. The only term in this series that contributes is the one where n is equal to m because all of the eigenfunctions are orthogonal to each other. And uh, what it contributes is just a factor of uh, the squared norm of the mth eigenfunction multiplied by the mth coefficient in this series. So now you see uh, that we have an inner product. This, so this is going to require that we do an integral. And uh, that integral will then be related through the squared norm uh, as this L over 2 factor. Uh, to the coefficient that we want. So writing all of that down and get rid of, getting rid of the inner product notation, we have that the Fourier coefficient here, theta m sub zero, is two over L times the integral over the uh, domain of, of uh, interest here is zero to L. And we have our mth eigenfunction multiplied by our, um, by our initial condition. Okay, so I put this into Mathematica and, uh, and look to see what, what answer Mathematica would give me. And uh, it does these integrals, of course, much faster than I do. And, um, and so this is the series of results going out to, uh, for m equals 1, out to 7. And uh, so just doing a little bit of algebra, you can uh, straighten this out and, and factor out some things. You get 200 over pi. Uh, here are uh, the series of eigenfunctions multiplied by time-dependent coefficients. What you see here is a slowly decreasing magnitude of the coefficient here at the at time zero. Uh, but as time goes on, note that uh, the increasing size of the eigenvalue will cause these to decay faster and faster. Uh, but at the initial time, this series decays very, very slowly. And that's happening because there was that discontinuity in our initial condition, right? So if you remember, our initial condition looked like this and then dropped down. Our, our eigenfunctions have to go to zero at both of these two boundaries. That's a boundary condition. So it takes a very, very long series, effectively an infinite number of these terms in this series, to actually get this thing to converge all the way up into this corner at the initial time. And uh, we can write down the series in this form. Uh, it's not, not, so, not so difficult to get this thing uh, in, a, in a closed form uh, summation index. 
And, uh, and what I want to point out here is that the long time behavior after all of the other eigenvalues with larger, with larger coefficients in here uh, are going to decay away. And the last one to decay is going to be the one with the smallest, the smallest eigenvalue. Okay, so uh, that's just saying that the long time behavior is dominated by the first eigenvalue, the one with the smallest absolute value. And, uh, and so at long times, we expect the solution will look like this. At short times, uh, we know that uh, eigenvalues above some certain, uh, some certain uh, n pi over l value will have decayed away. And we can estimate uh, which are the values that have decayed by saying that they decay when uh, the thing in the exponent up here becomes approximately 1, right? So now we have uh, some uh, ks squared times pi squared uh, alpha squared over l squared times ts. Uh, that should be about equal to 1. And, and uh, you know, if we're, if we're beyond that time, then uh, this wave number does not contribute to uh, the solution there anymore. And so that allows us to find that, that uh, wavelength that really, um, that, that really uh, shows, you know, where the, where the corner of the solution has decayed to up to a certain time. And uh, so specifically, uh, that wavelength is Ks inverse, it's really a wave number here, uh, multiplied by... Uh, by L. And that gives you the, the width of the corner that has started to see uh, the, the decay towards the equilibrium solution. So at very, very short times, it looks almost like this triangle and very quickly decays down here and then decays slower and slower and slower until all you've got is a slow decay of the last eigenfunction. And that's the physical, uh, the physical story behind uh, this approach. So, um, so that's separation of variables and hopefully now you can do it yourself.